Platforms are changing the economy stories of the world. If you look at the digital economy, we see it dominated by platforms. Platforms mobilize ecosystems of people, organizations and things. And as the word system already indicates, this is a complex matter. Hi, I am Adriana, and this is how I present myself on Airbnb. I was born in Slovakia, and I am a person driven by curiosity for a diversity of environments and cultures. I enjoy traveling in my free time. Airbnb is simply magical. It's the way how it enables people to meet and connect with the culture from within that attracts me. I consider myself as a great weekender. If Airbnb offered me a batch of a super guest, I wouldn't hesitate. And if you scroll through my profile, you will find 22 reviews. But wait a minute. I am not only a great weekender, it looks like I am a wonderful host too. Am I not competing with hotels in such a position? And what about all the other millions of Airbnb hosts across the globe that create value for Airbnb guests? Aren't they competing with the entire traditional hospitality industry? Talking about traditional. This is how we were used to perceive the economics for the past century. It's the business who creates the value and customers act mainly as passive consumers. Let's unpack this relationship a bit. If we take Apple as an example, in every iPhone produced, you will find an Apple-designed processor. Apple owns the shape of the iPhone, the design patent coverage on the rectangular devices with rounded corners. Once designed, the lovely iPhone needs to get manufactured. This is done by Apple's contractor called Foxconn, sitting in China and India. Once manufactured, the new iPhone is put into a nice box, which is also designed by Apple. And if the iPhone is not going directly to the consumer, it's going to retail stores, contracted by Apple, often even owned by Apple, example given Apple App Store, in which the interior is designed by Apple. Apple, 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 Apple. Have you noticed who is the dominant party in this relationship? The design aspect is one thing. But people are probably not standing in lines when the next model is being released because of the nice curves of the iPhone. Consumers benefit mostly from the usage of the phone. Now, think about the apps that you have on your phone. Facebook, Instagram, Slack or Trello, or all the nearly 2 million apps that are out there in the Apple App Store. The interesting part in this context is that there is someone else that joined the party with the Apple business and the consumer of an iPhone. Apple does not produce the majority of the apps, nor does it have the producers of those apps on its payroll. Which actually means that this picture is not quite accurate. Because when I use Trello or Instagram and I have a problem with that app, it's Trello or Instagram I will get in touch with, not Apple. So the primary relationship is actually between the producer and the consumer of that app. In this context, Apple acts as a platform business that facilitates the interactions between the producers and consumers of the apps. And the producers and the consumers are peers in this constellation. The creator of value is not a dominant party. What does this mean for Apple? Well, first and foremost, instead of having one customer group, there is someone else that Apple needs to support with services and tools that help developers to create fantastic apps. This brings forward not only many new opportunities, 
but especially new type of challenges that the platform business faces. I will demonstrate the most important challenge as follows. The major challenge platform organizations face today is this. It's taking a step back. It's about finding the appropriate distance between the platform organization and the interacting parties that the organization brings together. To make the distance challenge a bit more tangible, a couple of examples of platform organizations that didn't get it right in the first place should help to visualize this. Craigslist. Craigslist is an American classified advertisement website with sections devoted to jobs, housing, for sale, items wanted, services, gigs, and so forth. So you could find their cars, apartment listings, or whatever you needed at a particular moment in your life. But also guns, human trafficking, or dates that ended up tragically. Craigslist didn't care. And exactly for this reason, their section with personal ads had to be shut down by the regulator. Clearly, Craigslist was too far from the relationship between the producer and the consumer. Everybody knows Uber, the ride-sharing platform. However, according to the European Court of Justice, Uber is a transport services company requiring it to accept stricter regulation and licensing within the EU as a taxi operator. The reasons why this is the case are threefold. First of all, an Uber driver is not setting the price for the ride. It's Uber who says how much a journey is worth. Second, an Uber driver doesn't know the destination of the journey until a rider request has been accepted. And finally, an Uber driver can't really decline a ride. Otherwise, he or she is off the platform for the whole day. It's fair to say that Uber is too close to its producers. Similarly, the state of California reacted to the power of Uber and Lyft just at the end of 2019 and passed a bill that could give their drivers basic labor protections. If these companies are that close to their producers, then these producers deserve benefits that all employees get such as unemployment insurance, healthcare subsidies, paid parental leave, and so forth. If hundreds of thousands of independent contractors in California become employees under the bill, this will have a huge consequence on the balance sheets of the platforms that this applies to. Take Airbnb as an example. A host can set the price and is even provided with supporting services to do so. If a reservation gets cancelled, the guest will need to pay a charge for the damage caused. Airbnb is trying to balance things out in this relationship, and this requires a switch in perspectives. You need to acknowledge both parties as peers, not only the consumer. Try and search for a Star Wars Imperial Star Destroyer using the DuckDuckGo.com. What the search engine does is screen scraping the content of the websites and providing you with a short summary of what you're looking for without having to click on the particular link. But the producer behind the link would like you to click on that link and land on the main page of the source of the information. So while the search engine is making consumers life easier, it's hurting the producer. And finally, this legendary meme. What this meme is trying to convey is the difference between how Amazon behaves towards its third-party suppliers on the Amazon marketplace and a traditional retailer. Once Amazon sees that something is selling well, it copies the product and starts selling it under its own house brand, not surprisingly ranked at the top of the list. One could argue that all big retailers have done that before, but the scale, speed and scope Amazon can do this with is different. This brings me to the platform definition. Given all that we have learned so far about the impact of platforms on the society at large, it's fair to say that a platform is not about technology. It's not just a website or an app 
or a piece of software you buy from IBM. If someone says we bought this great platform from IBM, you can be 99% sure that it's not going to be a platform, just a piece of code. Because platform is a business model. It's a way of organizing yourself. It's a way of creating, capturing and distributing value. And this business model connects people, organizations and things. And at the same time, this business model facilitates coordinated value exchanges between the people, organizations and things. Airbnb connected me as a host with my guest Max from London and we coordinated ourselves so the visit was arranged on the dates that fitted both of us. And here is where technology comes in. Using digital services for scale, speed and scope. The critical difference to a linear business, the paradigm where we come from, is that in the platform context, it is a business model for all parties involved. So when Amazon is copycatting or Uber controlling their producers, it doesn't sound like it's a very profitable business model for all parties involved. And this is again what the main challenge is about. The challenge that all platform organizations face today. And if you allow me, let me pause here for a bit and ask you, why now? Why are we talking about this now? Why not 10, 20 or 50 years ago? Why precisely at this moment? Well, you could certainly come up with a plenty of reasons why we are talking about platforms right now. But the most important one seems to be the fact that communication is being digitized and will increasingly continue to be doing so. We are witnessing the next industrial paradigm, which is continuously being fueled by digitization of communication. And there are three bold implications of this force. First, more than half of the world's population has internet access. So once digitized, you could potentially reach pretty much anyone on this planet with that internet access. Yes, some countries may have firewalls around them, but potentially the leverage is infinite. Second, once digitized, you can go directly to the consumer. And because of the direct interaction between the producer and the consumer, the transaction costs fall to zero. You don't need any additional labor to bring your good or service to the market. The supply chain breaks. And third is the world of zero marginal costs. Once digitized, it costs you nothing to produce every additional piece into your inventory. On the other hand, This force is clearly challenging the way private and public enterprises conduct their affairs. The very structure of the firm is evolving. Its boundaries are blurring and becoming less defined. Where does Apple start? And where does it end? Where does Airbnb start? And where do I, as Airbnb host, end? Another aspect is the shape of the customer. Economies organized around scarcity. The current shift in technology and media paradigms ushers an economy organized around engagement. Customers don't expect to be passive consumers anymore, but active participants instead. And as these forces play out, context is becoming more and more central to value creation. It's not enough to be efficient at scale anymore. We might begin to harness learning at scale, because those who are most insightful and adept at understanding the context will be those who create the most value, both for customers and themselves. 
collectively, these represent the hardest of switches in the kind of business thinking we have been taking for granted for quite some time. Platform is the type of organizations that embraces all of these switches. This is especially reflected in the shifting ground of the current economy at large. The digitization of communication is removing barriers to entry, commercialization and learning. As a result, the organizational landscape is fragmenting into increasing number of entities, mini-brands, micro-companies, each with a small addressable market focusing on a specific niche with specialized products and services. Minimal investment is needed to enter the market. And these small entities spread out rapidly with no one controlling enough the market share to dominate the industry. In these parts of the economy, businesses compete on specialization, personalization and customization. Here, growing larger creates a performance disadvantage. Let me show you a couple of examples. This is the logo of Stratechery, founded by Ben Thompson, who is an amazing author of blog posts about, well, the strategy and business side of technology and media, and the impact of technology on society. Ben has been writing Stratechery since 2013, and it has been his full-time job since 2014. One man, based in Taipei. Sources confirm that Ben has several thousands of subscribers. That's a decent income for a one-man brand. But Ben is not McKinsey or any other giant in consulting. Earlier, if Ben wanted to reach enough customers, he would have to join one of those giants in consulting because they owned the distribution and the network. Today, Ben has a direct relationship with his readers and he wants to keep it like that. The story of Feeling Pieces, an Amsterdam-based fashion label founded by Guillaume Filbert. While studying architecture, Guillaume realized that there weren't any premium high-quality sneakers out there for a reasonable price. Recognizing both a challenge and an opportunity, he started to design a shoe that would bridge the gap between streetwear and high-end fashion. He then posted his idea on Alibaba, the Chinese giant platform that connects manufacturers with people that want to realize their ideas, and got his first batch of a couple of hundred samples produced and delivered to Amsterdam. This had such a success that after a while he moved the production to Portugal, where filling pieces contemporary collections are handmade with care, using only Italian materials. Can you imagine doing something like that 20 years ago? Where would you start? At Nike? And yet another great example of a fragmented market. With so many health and beauty products on the market, it may seem like consumers have all their needs taken care of. But Tristan Walker, founder and CEO of the health and beauty company Walker & Company, noticed a lack of companies focusing on people of color. Hmm. Tristan studied at Stanford and took on role on Wall Street and in tech. But his own frustrations led him straight to retail. And he became successful. Actually, he became so successful that Procter and Gamble acquired Walker and Company. But they didn't integrate the company in their overall offering. Instead, keeping it as a separate entity, Procter and Gamble wants Walker and Company to remain the way they are, small and themselves, while getting all the support and infrastructure they need to be the best they can. Interesting times. If you look at Procter and Gamble, one more time, this is an established organization, which is becoming more of an infrastructure than an entity with an addressable niche. In such a fragmenting environment, large organizations can only maintain a profitable competitive position by leveraging large-scale and capital-intensive infrastructures. 
Think about transportation networks, manufacturing equipment, or digital technologies. These parts of the economy are increasingly dominated by fewer, but larger entities and their value is predicated on being leaders in the market. Amazon Web Services, among three or four other leaders in the cloud infrastructure, or UPS, one of the world's largest package delivery companies. What else do we have? DHL or FedEx? The point is that concentrating infrastructures are instrumental to the viable operation of fragmenting markets, as they provide affordable access to information, resources and other high-volume services that can only be operated cost-effectively at scale. The forces of fragmentation and concentration are mutually reinforcing. Infrastructure providers find ways to achieve even greater scale by serving the needs of a growing arena of fragmenting markets. However, there are three aspects that need to be considered when supply and demand want to meet at internet scale. The first one is the triangulation, which is about how buyers and sellers find each other. How would ever someone find me as a host without Airbnb? Well, I guess I could still post my listing on Craigslist, but what if a murderer would show up? How can I be sure that I will be safe? This is all about the trust aspect. And the last aspect to be covered is transfer, which implies getting the good or service from the seller to the buyer. What does Airbnb do to ensure that my apartment is reserved exactly for that particular guest and at a particular date? You may have guessed it, but this is exactly where platforms integrate. So coming back to the previous platform definition, a platform is a business model that connects disparate fragmented players and facilitates coordinated value exchanges using affordable digital services provided by concentrating infrastructures. And just to close off this chapter, based on these two forces, fragmentation and concentration, that are reshaping the economy, we can see two types of platforms emerging. On the left side, we can see the innovation type of platforms that come mainly from the 90s and serve as a technological foundation upon which other businesses develop complementary innovations. Microsoft, SAP, AWS, to name a couple of examples. Talking about Apple and iOS. The other type are the transaction platforms, which were born in the early 2000s. These platforms indeed serve as intermediary in connecting for direct and coordinated exchange of value. We are all familiar with those. And if you squinch your eye a bit, you will see that all of the platform organizations have a bit of both aspects in place. However, one is more dominant than the other one. And exactly this brings me to the following model. It is more than obvious that platforms have two engines in place that make them successful. The transaction engine, which is predominant in transaction platforms, makes sure that participants transact in a secure way and in a repeated manner. The innovation engine generates all the support the participants need in their evolution and in becoming the best they can, using digital services. Now I have enough information to base the closing chapter of this presentation upon. Who gets to innovate in this kind of setting? Let's unpack this dimension with this graph which shows how much an organization has control over the value creation. An app developer designs and develops an app. Every single bit and piece, pixel or color is in the control of that app developer. The developer knows exactly what your need is and has a solution for you, specifically designed for your need. This is a mode of creation that is built on the premise that the customer is a passive consumer. 
the organization designs the service. But this mode of creation changes when the consumer gets actively involved. Stages of the production process shift to the user. And we are all familiar with this mode of creation. A great example is IKEA. When IKEA designs the product and provides a self-serve manual so the consumers can build it themselves. A rather famous IKEA product is the Carlux shelf, which is a great relationship test, but also a great product suited for places IKEA never intended to when designing this product. A restaurant in Amsterdam flipped the purpose of the shelf and started using IKEA's Carlux shelves as lamps. Who is the innovator in this case? Is it IKEA or is it a restaurant? One could find these kind of flips on ikeahackers.com, where again people with ideas were posting, well, hacks for the IKEA products. IKEA was trying to shut down the page until they realized that the people were innovating for them, for free. This is something IKEA has little control over. Another thing that you can't control or create is an ecosystem. It can get super interesting when the mode of creation shifts to the ecosystem. We call this mode of creation the ecosystem innovation. Take Airbnb and what the company does for its host and guests. There are millions and millions of listings on Airbnb. They range from single rooms, apartments, towards villas, castles or tree houses. Tree houses. No one at Airbnb's marketing department came up with the idea to include three houses into the inventory. No one at Airbnb came during one of their design sprints with a report from McKinsey that three houses are in and selling well now. Someone just got the idea and decided to open the doors of his or her castles to strangers. Another great example of the ecosystem innovation is Airbnb's first experience. Another product type that was randomly brought to Airbnb by a Japanese lady. The lady created a sake tour instead of a listing. And her first consumers were actually Airbnb's employees because they wanted to see what that is and how they could support her. Have you heard about RDNA? Not affiliated with Airbnb at all. RDNA collects short-term vacation rental data from hundreds of sources, including Airbnb, to build a comprehensive view of the short-term rental market and sells it to cities, for instance. Wouldn't it be great to incorporate this as a service to the overall Airbnb product catalog? So who gets to innovate in this world in which the ecosystem creates? People passionate about what they love and what moves them platform organization by supporting them and removing the barriers that stand between them and the thing that moves them? Or others you never thought could show up? This is what this mode of creation, the ecosystem innovation, is all about. It's about the ecosystem that innovates, not only about an organization in isolation. Based on all the challenges and opportunities we can see happening, it's fair to say that the world is transitioning from an age when the organizations were experts, that know the customer well enough to be able to come up with products and services that might be well suited to that particular segment. The organizations create, the customers consume. This expert mode of creation refers to designing of service, the primary driver of every organization in this age is efficiency at scale. The bigger it gets, the more customers and the further it can grow. In the world in which the ecosystem innovates, the mode of creation is designing for service to happen. An organization provides the context, tools and rules for the participants to start creating and exchanging value. The primary driver of each organization in this world is learning at scale. How else would Airbnb be able to discover the Japanese lady and to embrace the scope of their offerings, if not by sensing and responding to the ecosystem? As experts, we know how to design a proper service. 
And if some organizations fall behind because they are too big to keep up, for instance, there are plenty of best practices that can help to improve their current positions. Service design, lean startup, user experience or customer experience practices, to name a couple of them. We all know these practices, hence best practices. However, there is not much to be found on how to tackle the designing for service mode of creation. There are some theories, but no best practices that would help you to design and build a successful organization fitting this new world. This feels like a gap. And allow me to say that this is where architects come in. To create, share and communicate the models that describe the future state of an organization. This is where the next story starts. There is a need for a new toolbox so people understand their role and position in the platform context. The platform positioning set can easily bridge this gap. This toolset not only helps to understand the current paradigm, but it also helps you to find your current position and role in that paradigm. Take it on and start uncovering your ecosystem of people, organizations and things for new opportunities. Define a platform that supports this ecosystem in growing and innovating and develop your minimum viable platform to start learning from the future versions of your ecosystem. Download the toolbox using the QR code or the link in the description of this video. You will find there a manual that comes with all the material you need to start organizing and facilitating high-energy platform design sessions. There is no need for expensive trainings, coaches or consultants in order to start using this set. Should you still have any questions or remarks, feel free to get in touch. We love to learn from you.